This is Doc with Doc and Lefty. We're here for another show. This is going to be a rip snorter <laughs> because I'm going to tell you, Lefty, I gave Lefty plenty of time to get to get uh, geared up for this. He says he's going to give me an atomic elbow drop. Well, when I got to I'm going with a big fat belly flop well, right I'm, across the top. What I'm going to tell you is that uh that usually when in the in things like these doc is the he's the uh, the one that does all the work and uh ain't that the truth because it, i'm a conservative it's he's and i'm the one that expects the handout but <laughs> comes with the better ideas so when but but i'll tell you that when you do give me a task when you do give me an assignment i do fulfill on that assignment and so uh, uh i found some actual uh some numbers for some things we're going to talk about later and i hope that you all really enjoy the the next hour of the show because we're going to give you the definitive the definitive breakdown of the 2012 election that you can't hear anywhere else except webcast one live absolutely now i'm going to tell you there's been a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth and you know throwing of dirt and rolling around uh, music to, to my ears now. yeah music now, to i my don't ears. know frank's sleeping back there i don't know what he's doing what are you doing back there frank i think frank's got a girlfriend he's been a little discombobulated you got a girlfriend, Frank? <laughs> Almost. Almost. I think I oh my God, that's even worse. He's working on it. Oh man, don't give her any money. That's my that's my advice. Anyway, a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth. A lot of people screaming and yelling about, "Oh my God, we should have done this. We should have done that." Dick Morris, of course, was completely off the mark. The one guy what that did was Dick Morris say. Well, Dick Morris said it was going to be a landslide oh, and all right. that other crap. And well, so did Newt. It, yeah, Newt your boy. Said, yeah, my boy Newt. And um, I will tell you, I had an opportunity before the election to talk with uh, with uh, Dick Morris, and I tried to point out that the Republicans are paying attention to one the issues of the day, and two the composition of our our changing composition. Um, not necessarily black and white, but male and female. Uh, females make make up a large Lar- much larger percentage of people who actually vote than they have historically. 53%. And two, you know, they call it the browning of America. I don't, I don't like using that term. Um, I think, I think that we're always been multicultural. Mm-hmm. It's always, but that's been one of our strengths. So I don't like the term browning of America, but let's face it. The Republicans have worked hard, very hard to alienate Everybody. All right. I'm going to tell you, and people get up there and they talk about how great a campaign Mitt Romney ran. I'm going to tell you, having been involved in campaigns from the 80s and trying to re- resurrect another campaign based on 80s style campaigning for my own, it doesn't work. I got stomped. Mitt didn't necessarily get stomped. I mean, that's what the left likes to say is that, you know, oh, we pounded Mitt. Not really. If you look at the numbers, well, electorally, we got pounded. So what I'm trying to tell the Republicans is the big tent's the only thing that's going to work. We're going to have to figure out how we're going to include my, many more people than who we're including now. I can tell you there's 11 less million voters. Yep. Um, the statistic I heard is 7 million less Republican voters. I think it was 4 million less. No, four, 7 million less Democrats, 4 million less Republicans. Republicans are going, how come you didn't turn out? I can tell you, one of the kids at home, he didn't want to vote for either one. Yep. I talked to other people who said, you know, really, I went in and, and didn't vote for a president either way, or they wrote in Gary Johnson. I will tell you, how come you didn't vote for Mitt Romney? He scares me. How come you didn't vote for Obama? I can't vote for this again in another four years. That's why. Because you had a lot of people leaving, not voting, going, these are the two guys I got to vote for. I mean, it's I, I I've heard that from a, from a lot of different people, and I want to point out in case in case uh, my uh, my friend from New York calls in a little bit later if he's if he's tuning in. I hope that I don't step on you too bad because he's the one that pointed this out to me. He's pretty involved in uh in New York politics, and he at their Republican meeting um, they had a breakfast club. I think a couple of like either today or a couple of days ago. Uh, while they're recovering from the uh, the really horrible storm and then blizzard that they that they had, New York yes. just can't catch a break these last couple of weeks. But he pointed out that Mitt Romney did better in the overall vote than John McCain did. Yes. If Mitt Romney 
could have could have uh or he did worse than John McCain is what I meant to say. If he could have matched John McCain's level, the hated John McCain, the worst some Republican analysts call John McCain one of the worst presidential candidates to ever run, including Bob Dole. He would have, he would have destroyed Obama walking away. It wouldn't have even been close. If he could have matched McCain's turnout and Obama say the same, it would he would have been he, he would have killed him. Yeah. Now I agree. The, now so that's that's a very interesting point. The second other interesting point is one that you've uh, that I'm going to kind of follow up with you on, Doc. Is that it's the uh, the country is is just uh, it's it's all it's changing. It's always going to, it's always going to be changing. But what you see in the Republican Party the last few elections is really what you've been seeing from the Democrats from the 70s and the 80s up until up until Bill Clinton. Where and I heard this on uh, on one of the analysts on Meet the Press, and I think that's a really good point. In case you guys don't watch that program, was you have the Republican Party really trying to cater to a lot of different types of interest groups that have fallen out of step with where a lot of the country is right now. Um, I'm not talking necessarily about fiscal conservatism. I think there are a lot of folks where fiscal conservatism really resonates still to this day, but I'm talking about the uh, the really hardcore, the uh, the anti-immigration folks. I'm talking yes. about the anti uh the anti-global warming folks. I think there's. I think that the the consensus on climate change has really started to pass by the uh, the Republicans. We're trying to cater to all those different groups, and the rest of the country is kind of saying, "No, we don't. We don't want to see that." Kind of like when Ronald Reagan was sticking it to the Democrats back in the '80s. The Democrats had to cater to labor. They had to cater to the hardcore environmentalists. And we can't when when those groups start to diverge, and you can't bring your coalition together. You're going to have a whole lot harder of a time with presidential electoral politics. Absolutely. And I think that's, if the Republicans learn anything, it should be that, that they have to figure out, like you said, how to broaden the base, but to how to how to make those different aspects of their party more palatable. Here's a question that I've been meaning, wanting to ask you all week, and I hope that I have some time to get the yeah, question man. out. Maybe you'll be able to answer it after the break. Everyone was given Mitt Romney such a bad time for not running a conservative enough campaign. We heard, in, we've, we're hearing it again like we heard in 08, where we just need a true conservative. We need to distill the message. We need to purify it. We need to get down to our, our brass tacks and our principles. Hear that from, hearing that from everybody. My question to you is, I think that Mitt Romney ran a much more conservative campaign in the primary than John McCain did. That he was able to secure the nomination by running a very, yeah. at least on the surface, a much more conservative campaign where he talked about the personhood amendments. He talked yeah. about self-deportation. He talked about all these... Uh, he talked. He talked about sort of his um, opposition, in principle, to the Lilly Ledbetter Act. He talked about all these right. different, really conservative things that you know really jazzed up the base. Got him the nomination. That and that's where you saw the president in the po- like ahead in the polls you bet. by a ways. Then the then the uh, the pivot, pivot to the center, whichever candidate does. Yeah. Then the first debate, right. where you saw him, where you said he ran from the base, through those three debates, ran you from bet. the base. So I'm gonna I'll, I'll finish this up. If Mitt Romney closed the gap by becoming more moderate and the country elected the liberal anyway, what does that say about this country's um, appetite for conservatism as purified? I got the perfect answer for that. We are going to be right back after the break. Please stay tuned. This is uh, these sponsors are the ones that allow us to keep our uh, show going here. Um, you're listening to Doc on Doc and Lefty. Uh, we're on webcast1live.com. We'll see you after the break. Take us out, Frank. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. Oh, I brought uh, along a couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I'm administrative manager. I'm the senior technician. I'm Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. Just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, um, that we're gonna do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do. And if we guarantee it's going to be a good experience for you or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're going to do? (laughs) There is a guarantee. 
Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we'd fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you going to say that to a client? No. <laughs> You don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're going to be listening. They're going to want to know what your challenges are. Then they're going to come and give you options, and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family. You know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now and then leave and then come back, charge you again, and, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I want to find why it failed the day. How can we change the part today with something that you're not going to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me. But is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did was perfect. It was great. <laughs> Keep going, though. I like this. <laughs> just give us a try. I'm going to take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed writer, it's free or 100% money back. Enough said. This is Doc with Doc and Lefty. Thanks for coming back, joining us. Before the break, Lefty was basically asking a, a question. Uh, the question was, um, what does that say if Mitt Romney went to the middle and still lost? Well, no, a, no, that's not exactly what it said. Oh, Mitt my Rom God, here Mitt comes Romney, the lawyer. He's Mitt Romney, the face with this. Mitt Romney went to the center and was gaining in the polls. He was improving his poll position by moving to, to the, the center. center, and they still elected the liberal. What does that say about the conservative message? Well, there's, that says, I will tell you, there's three different things to this. Mm -hmm. I don't think it speaks anything to the conservative, the, the conservative message. That's, that's my first thing. The second thing, you have to keep in mind that as soon as they elected Mitt Romney, he lost the conservative base, period. You and I talked a lot about that. You and I talked a lot about his record. We talked, I talked a lot about you can't hire the guy who who has Romney care, which is the basis for Obamacare. You can't have you can't elect that guy and expect the conservatives to unite behind him. But he, all you had was conservatives. That's what if if that was so terrible, then why did he get the nomination in the first place? Well, the just like um, just like when uh, I ran for for Congress, mm -hmm. that the splitting that vote among seven people. Um, really, really made it much easier for Brad to come out and win. Um, the guy who finished second was Jim Gibbons. If we hadn't split the vote, Jim Gibbons would have easily could have won because Brad and I split votes, um, Funk and Brad split votes. And if you add me, Funk, and, and Brad together, I mean, that's what Jim Gibbons could have, could have had. You know, or me, me and Funk. If you had me and Funk together, that's people that Jim Gibbons could have had, and he could have beaten Brad's on. So you have six million people running for, for office. You only have two people there that really had the potential to beat um, um, Obama, and neither one of them got elected. Hmm. So you have Mitt Romney running. The second thing is, we got a call there, Doc. Oh yeah. Oh my goodness. Really. Hey, we should stop acting so surprised. This is two weeks yeah, in a row. Yes, two weeks in a row. Yes, let's plug in. Hello, you're on Doc and Lefty. Hey, Doc and Lefty. How are you today? I'm doing all right. Oh, this must be your friend from New York. <laughs> this is Doc Tommy O from New York City. Yes, it is. Hey, Doc. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Okay, how are you guys tonight? Not hey, too we're, bad. Doing, we're doing well. That's good. I think that's good. We're uh, trying to still recover here in uh, New York City. It's yeah. uh, tough for us. You got, uh, you got heat and power up there yet? Uh, yeah, actually, because um, uh, I live in Midtown, uh, New York City, and when you looked on the map, when uh, the the um, the TV uh, the stations were broadcasting New York City, you had Lower Manhattan, which is called the Financial District, 
they were flooded out, and I live in Big Town, and that was the other section that lost power. But we're back power again. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, so we're back in action. So what do you, what do you, you got a question for us? You have something you want to say tonight? Well, I was just calling in to see how you guys are doing. What's the topic of discussion? Because I, I know things have uh, evolved over the past, uh, you know, few months, especially past, the past weeks, and now the past uh, two weeks. But what's, what's tonight's topic? Well, uh, tonight's topic is um, voter fraud and how the <laughs> Democrats perpetrate it all the time. Uh, right now, uh, the question before us right now is how come uh, if Romney moved to the, to the center – and got more people, uh, or, or started pulling better in the polls. How come the the moderate or the liberal got voted back in? And so we were discussing, you know, one Republicans uh, met lost the conservative base, and I know Tom, you're a conservative as well, yeah. and and you had a lot of reservations about because we've talked about it before. You had a lot of reservations about Romney Care, and you had even more reservations about Obamacare. And then the the second point is is uh, Republicans don't uh, adjust well to modern technology like the Democrats do. There's early voting. Democrats got people together in voting parties, bust them to the early voting stations, got them off the bus, took them into the voting booths. Hold on, not actually into the booths. Actually, but, Doc, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna break in right here and and, and let our uh, our caller maybe address some of this. All right, the stuff. You're right. So, you know, I, get, I get going. Keep him. He's got. He's got a family to take care of up there in in a blizzard stricken <laughs> New York. Yes, that's right. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, I, I, I'll just uh, a little uh, from my uh, vantage. You know, I, I again, I live in New York City, and and New York City is like one, one of the most uh, liberal cities in the in the uh, in the states. Um, regarding uh, the social media, yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent correct that the Republicans are behind, and that's. Uh, they're at a disadvantage. Um, the, uh, the the liberal Democrats, their uh, younger generation, because you have two huge voting bases. You would have the uh, the fifty, the late fifties to, uh, to late sixties, the so called like hippie generation, and their children that are in the uh, late twenties and early uh, late to, uh, late twenties uh, to uh, late thirties, and they're very very tech savvy. A lot of them work in the tech industry. If not, they're very artistic, and uh, they're able to uh, uh, uniform and spread their message through uh, the social media, like Facebook and so forth. And that's something that the, um, unfortunately, that the conservative or republic, uh, Republican uh, demographics, where I call aging out, where the golden um, age, uh, our grandparents are dying off, and our parents who would fall uh, in, as a conservative are getting older, and they're not tech-savvy. Then you have our generation. We're tech savvy. However, our we're not having the, the number of children. Uh, you know, we're, like I don't have any biological children, and all my cohorts might have only one child. So we're starting to lose a significant voting base. And then if uh, you know, and then if you include not being tech savvy, we're really behind the ball. So, am I just? Uh... Correct, in, in that neither one of you think that there's a problem with the conservative message at all, even uh, though... Yeah, 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 there definitely is. Um, there is a, a disconnect where right now the Democratic Party, uh, what they, they painted out a picture that uh, the, the conservatives are old, white, greedy men, which is not the case. We definitely do have uh, people of color and other races that are conservative. Mm -hmm. But the you know the message that's being uh, portrayed is definitely not the message that needs to be out there. That we are caring the people uh, that we are with the most generous people. You know, I mean, you see all the statistics that we do uh, donate. We are, we are very charitable, and we're the most charitable people because we are within the highest financial making. Uh, demographics, and we donate a significant amount of money, and, and the, the state that leads is Utah, and that's the Mormons, and no one even addresses that. And you can look up these statistics, the facts, are, you know, all over online. Um, no one addressed that, you know, to prove a point, saying, hey, we, we give to the community, and right now the message that's portrayed, or the image that's portrayed, is we're not giving given at all, and we just take, and we're greedy, we're Wall Street guys, we're money hungry, and that's the message... That's that's the exact opposite of what we're really are. We're very caring people. We believe in in our founding fathers' message that 
We need to become educated. We need to work as a group. We fight. We work hard. And we move forward together. And that's not the message that's being portrayed at all. I, you know, I, I really can't, uh, I can't argue too much with that. Um, you know, we, we can talk, we can cry uh, foul because I know that the Democrats back in in uh, in late 2002 and then 2000 in the 2004 election were really upset that the uh, Republicans were painting us as as lily livered cowards who you know who were in the back pocket of France and and weren't strong on national security and and uh, weren't patriotic especially that was the big thing that always stuck in my craw that as a Democrat I was definitionally unpatriotic so I really understand where you're coming from I just wonder. Is there a uh, is there a sense that, and we won't keep you on too long, but uh, is there a sense that uh, that there needs to be sort of one of the big things you hear in the news is that there needs to be a more appeal toward uh, Latinos especially because Latino the Hispanic population in this country broke pretty heavily for President Obama is and if that has something to do with us if you're going to see a softening in the uh, the illegal immigration debate on the Republican side. Oh, absolutely. You're already you know, talking about it right now, and that's uh, a current <laughs> topic. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even, even greater than that, and I'll give you an example, statistically, uh, a larger population is the Asian population, where there's a total disconnect. Here in New York City, we have about a 40% Asian population, and they're a working class, uh, and, they, and they voted for Obama. So you're like, well, what happened? Where was that disconnect? And they have a, a, a their work ethic is not liberal. It's 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 a conservative work ethic. The harder you work, you're gonna make it in America. The entire family works together. It's a totally different, but they did not join forces and they went liberal. And there's a total disconnect there. So not only did you have the Hispanic population, because in immigration you have the fears, you know, because I in New York City we have um, you know, you have uh, some Mexicans, and we have a lot of uh, Dominicans, and, and then we have the Puerto Ricans, which are or Americans, but it's a territory, but they're, you know, because of the voting and what they're allowed to have, they get the benefits without certain restrictions uh, versus, like, a Dominican who's not an American at all, but we have a large population there. But then if you go into Queens, we have a huge population uh, along the Seven Line. That brings you to where Shea Stadium, well, now it's uh, city, a city field. Uh, that's where the Mets play. If you go along, you'll have uh, Colombia, you'll have Ecuador, you'll have El Salvador, and you go right down the, the each train stop. And sure. that's pretty significant. Yeah. Uh, if you, you when bet. you're on the train and you look into the playgrounds, you see all the temporary. Uh, there's no more playground. Yeah. It's, right. It's hey, 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 Tom, we got to yeah. take a break. Okay. I want to say thanks for for tuning in. I'll give you a call after the show. Okay, well, I just, uh, you know, I mean, we're, you guys are doing a wonderful job, and, you know, regardless, you know, you're both Americans, and you're trying to make a difference in the community and make us, uh, you know, better, I wish you continued success with your show. All right, thanks, well, a, thanks lot, a lot, Tom. Tom. Okay. Good. We'll be back right after the break. Frank, get us out of here. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome, not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. It's like they want to get hit. Need a body shop? This is Doc with Doc and Lefty. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Thanks, Tommy, uh, Dr. Thomas O'Brien from New York for calling in today. Um, to finish up, the question that, that Blake was asking is, is there something wrong with the conservative message if Romney suddenly started polling better against Obama? One of the things is that all the pundits agree to, liberal and conservative pundits, is 
the week before Sandy hit, it was pretty. It was at least going to be a much closer battle. Forty-two percent of people at the end said, "You know, Sandy really kind of changed how I viewed the president." Ah, uh, I've heard now, this too. Now, well, that means that God wanted Obama to win. Well, no, right? I'm, so. I'm not. I'm not trying to say <laughs> that, but you know, you 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 know, you look at there's many factors that. Why Mitt Romney lost? Do you think that's and, why? That's do you think that's why um, Mitt took uh, took Iowa? Or, I mean, why uh, Obama took Iowa because of that hurricane in New York? No, um, I just I mean, Iowans, it, Iowans came out at a record rate. Um, I saw the statistic this morning: almost eighty percent of Iowans voted. Yeah, we beat the nation with everybody else. And what that tells me is Iowans were highly motivated to have a voice. Obamaites were highly motivated. Republicans were highly motivated. We have a new we have a new uh, chairman, AJ Spiker, mm-hmm. and um, I will. And we I, are, we we reelected we reelected two Iowa uh, Republican representatives to the state or to the uh, to Congress too. Yes, so. and, and two and we reelected two Democrats. Mm-hmm. So the for me, how I look at this is the Democratic machine, and I don't say that despairingly. I mean, I or not despairingly, uh, disparagingly. Mm-hmm. I see that with a great deal of respect. They got people on the bus. They got them to the voting areas. They utilized the new technology, and they motivated their voter base. Now, of course, there's all kinds of stories about how they're grabbing people with mental incompetencies and making them vote. I don't, you know, if there was things like that going on, I'm sure it's a very small percentage and just simple oversights. The bigger picture is the Democrats motivated their people made it easy for them to vote, got them to the polls, helped them do all this stuff, and the Republicans didn't do anything. Republicans sat around and went, we're going to show up on voting day. Well, the problem is, if you're trying to show up on voting day and you're going, I got Mitt Romney or Barack Obama, to me, honest to goodness, it's Romney. It doesn't matter to me who you elect. But that's- Romney wasn't going to get rid of Obamacare. He even got out. I can tell you, he eliminated twenty percent of the people that could have voted for him when he said, "Well, I like parts of Obamacare." Bam. But that's. But once again, I mean, I feel like that that sort of means to me. It sounds to me like the conservative base is just a petulant five year old, because when you have a voting block that was as united against this president. I'm not talking about Congress now, so I don't want sure. to get misunderstood. You bet. But when you have a voting block that was is united against this president, as any voting block probably easily since the you know uh, the last year and a half of Clinton's presidency, the conservatives hated this president. Not personally, just I get it. You know I what I'm saying? It. Yeah. They were they were dead set against him, and you heard these Republican uh, pundits back in the uh, the early stages of this primary campaign saying it doesn't matter who we who we elect. Doesn't matter who runs against Obama. Obama's going to lose. He's got a Jimmy Carter economy. Doesn't it? Doesn't matter. Well, it does. It did matter. matter. It, it did and, matter. You know, and you know, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you this. And this is going to alienate me from. I probably won't get invited to any more Republican conventions after this. But uh, we lost on social issues. That's what we lost. Uh, we. That's may, true. Um, I will tell you that when you get up there and you say, "Well, even in cases of rape." You get to carry your child, and more importantly, when you get done carrying this child who is a conception of rape, at the end, we're not going to provide any kind of social services for you. That's a losing argument. I am pro-life from conception to natural death, right? I'm 100%, you know, you can't compound, you know, the sin of the father with committing your own sin. That's whether or not you agree, that's how I believe. Mm -hmm. And I also believe that if you're going to outlaw abortion, you need to get the social programs in place in order to support these people. That's what they are. And what happens is when you try to articulate that message, when you're a, a person that don't doesn't understand, other people think differently than you, which is part of the problem with politicians in general. Mm-hmm then you're really going to stumble into, well, hold on. If my daughter gets raped by a, by a convicted killer, what am I going to do? How's that going to tear apart my family? Right. I'm going to tell you, I tell them, I, you know, these people that come up and talk about, you know, I want the government to pay for my birth control and my abortions and everything else. You know, 
I'll stay out of your womb. You stay out of my pocket. Well, here's what you know. What's what's fascinating about what you just said is um, what you hear a lot from the uh, from a lot of the Republican candidates that ran this this cycle, and what you hear a lot just from the really well, I guess the candidates because you can't really even call them the extreme right because they're in the mainstream of politics at this point um, is that uh, it's a it's a baby, it's a person, it's a child. That was interesting, but yeah, that's okay. Something happened. It's a it's a child till it's born, and after it's born, it's a mistake. So they're gonna make you. They're gonna <laughs> they're gonna have they're gonna make <laughs> sure true. that you have that baby. They're gonna take care of you. Make sure you have that child. Make sure the child is healthy. But then afterwards, hey, look, we no. It, uh, hey, you, you shouldn't have gotten knocked up. That's what, and that's, and I know that's not the message, but that's, that's what it sounds like. But that's how it comes off. Absolutely. Yep. Speaking of speaking of sexy time, should we talk about the big scandal rocking Washington right now? Should we get oh, into yeah. it? Let, let's. Uh, how, um, we got about. Um, let's go to a commercial break. After the commercial break, we'll 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 hit the the voter fraud. Okay. And then we'll save uh the the big sex scandal to the end. Sounds good. All right. We've been we've been doing that a lot recently. Yes, yes. Leaving the sex the, scandals till the, the end. end. Of the yes. Show. Well, it makes people tune in. That's right. Yeah. All right, you're listening to Doc with Doc and Lefty. We'll be back in about a minute. Thanks for tuning in. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios. This is Webcast 1 Live. If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. This is Doc with Doc and Lefty. Thanks for joining us tonight. Our next topic is going to be voter fraud and how it's perpetrated in Ohio and Florida. So, Lefty, have at it. Give, well, me, this that, is, give me that atomic well, elbow this is, drop. This is your, you know, this is your thing. This was your... Yeah, uh, that's true. Well, then I'll start it. I'll you, start this it. is your thing that you brought up because I don't it, think that it, voter fraud is a very big deal. I'm, I'm uh, Well, because liberals don't think voter fraud is a very big deal. Because we like reality. Because no, because you guys like being in power, and and the more dead people you get voting, the better off you're going to be. Oh boy, you oh, know that was boy, it yeah. was that you know dust that don't dust that one off too hard. Yeah. You might break it. I, I might. Now I want to take a giant leap off the third turnbuckle. That's in the honor of my uh, buddy uh, Scott Casper, who announces the professional. Well, see, you actually have now. see. I that's why my reference was so bad because I don't really watch professional wrestling that much. So uh, I don't really understand. Right. Well, Can you even do an atomic elbow drop off the top buckle? I'm pretty sure you could. Okay, go ahead. It, anyway, um, there are places in Ohio that have zero votes for Romney, one vote for Romney, two votes for Romney, out of the entire precinct. And what you see on Facebook is there's 900,000 people in Cuyahoga County and nobody voted for Romney. I'm going to tell you that's not true. There are precincts within Cuyahoga County that really are not um, Romney bastions. And, but it still seems pretty suspect that you have precincts with zero votes coming out. Mm -hmm. So I think if it's not voter fraud, it at least has to be some kind of voter irregularity. Because remember, this is the, the, the county that had uh, reports that if you hit oh, Romney, that it would, wouldn't let you vote for Romney, it would pop up that you voted for uh, Obama. Well, what's so, what's so interesting about that is that wasn't Ohio also the state that where all the voter machines were owned by Tag Romney and Ohio is the one with the secretary of state who's a Republican and who tried to limit all the early voting in all the Democratic counties. So, I mean, Ohio and as far as voter fraud is concerned, I think there's a lot of more of a problem on the Republican side. But I went I went through and looked at some of the numbers that you popped up there, Doc, about the the uh, the issues, um, the uh, the polls that came out of 
the places that had the most zero votes for Romney in their precincts. And that was in East Cleveland, Ohio, which is one of the suburbs, and Cleveland itself. And a few of the precincts had zero votes for Romney in the unofficial tallies. In the but unofficial tallies. Unofficial. Not been certified by the Secretary of State. And I, I want to point out, first of all, in East Cleveland, in Cuyahoga County, 17,843 people in 2010 lived there. 17,000 people. Not a great many of people. Not, not a great number no. of people. So not a great number of registered voters there either. And I'm going to tell you that of those 17,000 people, 93.4% of them are African American. So because it, just from the math, because the African Americans turned out in such large numbers for the president, you're going to have precincts where there might not have been a single Romney vote. It makes sense to me from a math standpoint. The other one was Cleveland, the city of Cleveland proper. You know how many uh, uh, African Americans make up 53.3% of Cleveland of the entire city? Yeah. Yeah. And so out of those precincts, out of those precincts with the vast majority of them being African American, I can understand how maybe a couple of them in the unofficial tallies didn't have a vote for Romney. I can. Would it have, sw- would it have swung the election? No, because Romney lost by 40 points in Cuyahoga County. It was like yes. 68 to 30 or something. It was just well, ridiculous. And, and here's on uh, humanevents.com has a very interesting article about it. And that is Romney won handily the rest of Ohio. He just didn't win Cuyahoga County, and he lost it so badly that he that the vote tally there is really the vote tally that he lost by, which is a fairly interesting analysis of um, how we're it's not necessarily a split between you know Democrats and Republicans, but it's really becoming a split between urban and rural population centers. Yeah, yes, if you absolutely. don't have a whole lot of people, and but that's and that's the you don't want to see if you're a Republican, I feel like you are on the wrong side of that because you don't want to be. In Wyoming, if you're a Republican, necessarily no, you want you want to be, be where in, the people are. You're in New York and California. Yeah. So um, now the next thing we're going to talk about uh, is one of the, one of my campaign issues is we spend so much money on this stupid stuff that you know the the truth of the matter is now. Oh, I wanted to say this beginning of the segment. I was talking to Dick Morris. I like saying that. <laughs> it, it. He was he was one of the things he pointed out was. All the advertising on TV, all the advertising on radio, all the advertising in newsprint did not move the polls one way or the other. It was only the debate and it was only social media that got things moving one way or the other. That's, that's his perspective, right? Well, And I, so okay. when you start talking about how much money they all spent, now Romney – that on his own only raised what 350 million something like that and obama of course raised 650 million that's a billion dollars everybody else throwing in spent another one and a half to two well one to 1.5 billion dollars that's a billion with a b yes so there's 2.5 billion dollars out there being spent on the presidential election that is enough to provide every child born in the u.s with every vaccine it needs through till it's an adult for the next 15 years. Now, I think that spending is ridiculous. Um, not a, I know I'm going to get in trouble with Republicans here. I don't think I don't like that Citizens United you know decision. Um, I believe it's just going to be more and more money spent. Uh, funny enough, all the Wall Streeters supported Obama the last time around are now supporting Mitt Romney this time mm-hmm. around. Um, fine, support who you want. But the bottom line is we need to put a cap on how much money you spend, period. If you're coming out and trying to support, you know, something, the problem is free speech. Hold on. Speech, free, free speech isn't a problem, but you're going to impede on somebody's free speech, but you're well, going to have to limit. Like we got another caller here, doc. Oh my goodness. Holy cow. It's a plague. It's a, it's an epidemic. It's an epidemic. <laughs> this is Doc with Doc and Lefty. Oh. Hello? Oh, we're talking to Frank. We don't want to talk to Frank. We talk to him all the time. Oh, that's okay. He's he's uh he's scre- he's screening the person for us. What I you know what I was what I would say yeah. um is I mean it's what what's tough the rationale of Citizens United is tough because they did they looked at money as speech. Yeah. And if more money means that you get your message out there louder or 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 more effectively, it's hard to come up with that it's hard to limit that 
You know, it's Absolutely. hard. It's hard to uh, come up with a, ju- a legal justification that allows that to uh, to go by the wayside. Because, I mean, on, from a practical politics side, if I was speaking to this as a as a practical uh, politician, yeah, Citizens United for the Democrats is terrible, and I've got the numbers to back it up. Uh-huh. Um, the president in the top ten don't uh, the top ten spenders, individual spenders in the in this last election for the last twelve weeks before the election. Um, the president had one. And in fact, his second his second highest came in thirteenth, and that was the service employ uh, the service employees international yeah. union. So the Democrats were outspent from a from an individual donor from the the super PAC stuff by far and away, which is what they expected to happen. But as sort of gross as that sounds to a Democrat, if you value free speech, and if also you think that money equals speech, I mean how. It, it, we we want more free speech. We want more political speech in this country, not right. less. We can't Absolutely. limit it. Well, now, one of the interesting things I found on OpenSecrets.org was the number one donor to President Obama was the University of California. Now, I don't know, I don't know about that. I mean, I mean, because they don't it, – it's everybody who's associated with the University of California, fundraisers, all mm-hmm. that stuff. But I found that rather interesting is that a government institution – well, I mean, basically, government institutions are the ones that make up about 50% of his top donors. And f- from my perspective, I would think that that would be a conflict of interest. What do you mean? You know? well, what do you mean government institutions? I don't understand that. Um, uh, like the University of, uh, uh, of California is one. Uh, the, you mean like the administration, like the university cut him a check? Or well, individual professors and individual professors and all that stuff. Yeah, you know, because they, you know they're not allowed to actually give in their name. They're just lumped together under there. I right. just found that were pretty interesting. Well, it, but see, that's also that also sort of the because you're talking about they didn't donate to the president. You know, directly they donated through a super PAC, right? Yeah, kind of the way the, that uh, Bill Martin. Well, see, that's yeah. the problem. I mean, you have you have folks that I mean that you had one billionaire in Nevada donate 140 million dollars to this thing. You had two billionaires in Texas donated you know 50 million dollars to this thing that's i mean and i'm not saying that's a problem necessarily mm-hmm. i'm not saying because you know it, except that maybe their money buys more speech than my money would i don't know mm-hmm. but what i'm saying is we know about that because they gave individually you bet but we don't know about the 142 million dollars that mitt romney super PAC restore our futures but where all that money came from we don't have to disclose that you don't know about american crossroads or carl rove super PAC. Uh, Priorities USA, Bill Burton. Yeah, you don't no, know about but, any of that stuff. Well, but you and I can both agree that that we need to put a limit on how much money is actually spent on a presidential campaign and on. I just think who, that corporations shouldn't be considered people as far as voting is concerned. So I can't get you to agree to. Put well, a well, no, limit I, 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 I agree. I agree. Not. I, I agree with the sentiment. Let's put it that way. All that right. money is messing yeah. stuff up. Well, we gotta go to a break. Right before we go, uh, one of my friends on Facebook says. Pat, you're converting right before my eyes. Oh my goodness, that's that's sad. If I'm see, that's what kills me. I used to be a radical Reaganite, and now I'm a moderate Republican. I don't get how that happened. The party had abandoned you. <laughs> well, we got to go to commercial break. We'll be back after after about a minute or Can so. Can I get the donkey punch in the elephant? Yeah, yeah, get the donkey punch in the elephant there. Pow. So we'll be back in a minute. Well, Lefty and I will settle this in the, in the, in the interim. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back in a minute. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome, not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. It's like they want to get hit. Need a body shop? Minor Wreck Express saves you time and money. 
This is Doc with Doc and Lefty. This is our uh, not our necessarily our final segment. We have the medical minute, which we're going to be going over sleep apnea and the Lubinus legal brief, where Blake's going to go over well legal stuff. Um, Maybe if we have enough time. If we have enough time, right? General Petraeus. Oh man, what a sad ending. <laughs> that it's, is it's just... almost worse than Joe Paterno. It's awful. Almost. Not quite as bad because, you know, at least didn't Petraeus. Involve touching kids. It didn't smokes. involve kids. But in every other way, this looks like a ginormous cluster. Well, holy cow. I mean, first of all, the guy that single handedly won the Iraq war for all intents and purposes. Absolutely. His, not just his command, but his strategy and paying off the, the, uh, the Sunni leaders to flip sides was a stroke of military genius from a counterinsurgency standpoint. Absolutely. And this guy, but we, you hear, and now you're here, you're seeing all the people pile onto him now, how he wasn't very well liked at the CIA, how he and Obama didn't get along too well, but how Barack didn't, or how the president really didn't want to accept the resignation because um, he's a credit to the, the organization. And probably from a political standpoint, because he didn't want to see him run against him in four years. Absolutely. That was part of it too. But he wanted to keep him in the keep him in the shop, but his uh, I think it was Petraeus's own advisors were saying you as a CIA director you can't get out, you have to get out in front of this and you can't stay. You yes, at this absolutely. point you've there's a there's FBI probes there's all kinds it's serious but stuff. But the FBI knew months ago yep. and informed Harold Holder and that's who they answer to. They don't answer the president. Right. I mean, obviously everybody answers the president in some right. But really, they answer the Holder. Holder knew. The FBI came out and said, we notified Holder in June. This is what was going on. Petraeus got wind that, this was, that he was being investigated into the affair, right? And next thing you know, it's branching out into other people. But this woman, this, uh, this woman that he had the affair with, I mean, this could have, if she had kept her mouth shut and not gone after one of his friends, this, you'd never, we would have never known about it. Absolutely. You know, I mean, that's that's what pro, that's what got the FBI involved in the first place was that this family friend of the Petraeuses of Holly Ann and the general alerted the FBI saying she's getting threatening emails that ha, that happened to have a lot of personal yeah. information about David her, Petraeus in them. Her last name. Now, this is a well, a days of our of our lives moment. Yes, David Petraeus is having a an affair with a woman who is very attractive. And unfortunately, his wife, who I think is a very lovely woman, is a little bit older and a little bit rounder. And, you know, so you can kind of see where, you know, this lady fed into his ego. So he's having an affair with this lady named Breadwell. And she has a friend named Kelly. Or her last name's Kelly. And she's having an affair with a general named Alan, or at least some kind of... You know, is that what it is? I don't because think it's an affair. It might not be an affair, but they Kelly is the friend fruit. of Petraeus. Yes. Right. And so what you have is um, Breadwell, the, the mistress, sending threatening notes to Kelly and apparently uh, threatening emails, apparently using government <laughs> government <laughs> things. What is it with people? How well, dumb can you get? Anyway, and now they're investigating Twenty to 30,000 emails exchanged between General Allen and this Kelly lady in about an 18-month period. Yep. I can tell you, I, I never throw out an email in my uh, in my uh, Mind Jockey account uh, at AOL. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's, my, that's not a big secret. And I'm going to tell you that I've had it since, um, you remember Prodigy with Sears? Yep. And then... AOL bought out Sears. That's how long I've had this account. I've kept all my emails. I only have 6,000. All right. You know how many emails you got to send? That's all that guy could have been doing. Just well, that's, emailing. But see, you don't, you don't, if you send an email, it's, it's pretty, it's a little bit longer. You know, it's not more than just a, hey, what's up? I bet that's what a lot of it is. Well, yeah, but still 20,000 of them. Holy well, smell. remember it's 20, 20 to 30,000 pages of documents. So it could, it doesn't necessarily have to all be emails. Well, that, but, no, they, they specifically said 20, they? 30, 000 emails and related documents. Well, here's here's my here's the the oh. funniest thing about this to me is this this Broadwell this woman is um you know she's yeah she's a little young she's not 
super duper young though. She's probably what in her thirties um, or forties. She's probably just tipped over the scale of forties. And of course, yeah. General Petraeus is in his sixties. Sure. So, you know? so you're not, you're not, you're not, you're talking about a mature career. And she was in the military too. She career was career veteran woman who's a journalist, professional, sending emails to this family friend of the Petraeuses that basically, from the reporting that I've read, ta- or have the tone of this woman of, of, of a uh, of a jealous sort of immature, he means more to me than he does to you, and I can prove it because this is what I know about him sort of stuff. This was yeah. this was schoolyard. This was just down in the gutter, mudslinging at the most basic high school level that I just find completely amazing. Absolutely. Um, and it's it's one of these things. I have a very dear friend of mine, Pat Van Zandy, and she always told me this. If you can't be immoral, for God's sakes, be discreet. That's right. And the the problem is, and this is, I'm go back to President Clinton now. I don't care who Clinton screws, none of my business. But it is my business if he's screwing somebody in the White House because that makes that office vulnerable just like it makes the office of the CIA director. So you think you should, you think that resigning was the right way to go? Oh yeah, absolutely. Cause there's people out there that there's, there's a few people and this is kind of bipartisan that feel like you shouldn't have. Yeah. And I don't get me wrong. He's very talented, but you cannot have that kind of behavior in such a sensitive position. Um, Billy Brunt, I'm going to invoke Billy Brunt. He was having an affair with his secretary way back in the sixties. Turns out she was a Russian spy, and they knew all of our codes and everything else because he trusted her because he was sleeping with her. There's something that happens to a man's brain when he's having sex with a woman, and that is it shuts down and all kinds of irrational stuff happens. You know, we're men. We know it. You know, Frank, he's trying to work, get a girlfriend, so he might know it. But, you know, that's, that's what it is. He had to retire. And what's sad is it's really expanding quickly. Yep. And it, what kills me is the timing of it. Now, one of the things I am proud of that Petraeus said, I'm still going to testify at the congressional hearings over Benghazi. I'm glad for that. Now, the Republicans knew that um, Clinton was bugging out to uh, Australia. They knew that she was going next week. I don't know why they couldn't have waited a week to have her come back and testify. But there's something going on over in Benghazi. It certainly sounds like a cover up. It could just be, you know, natural screw ups along the way. But Petraeus is going to know, and knowing him, he's going to just tell it the way it is. Well, he doesn't have anything to hide, or he doesn't have anything to lose now. His no. career is over, and he it, yeah, in the military, yeah, yeah, because and, that's a court martial offense. Well, I thought that he was he wasn't still in the military though. I, I didn't think, but he was having an affair while he was in the military. Well, they wouldn't go after him in court martial and after the fact, would they? No, well, because he's, I, he's, I don't reti- know he's a retired called. general now. Yeah, but they can they can reduce his rank and take his retirement pay. I don't think they'll do that, though. Do you? That, I, I mean, don't know. He's, he was. You see, you just they, seen they a get, guy. They get, they get pretty bent about that stuff. Uh, well, for people that are still serving, and, and they're yeah. they're harder on the underlings more so than the top brass. I feel no, like. they immediately relieve the top brass, and that's yeah. the end of their career. I mean, mm-hmm. they they do. You think he's got a political career? I hope so. <laughs> I, I hope so. I'm going to tell you, and you know who I, you know what? I'm going to tell you this. Colin Powell ever ran? I'd vote for him. I know he's kind of betrayed us with the Obama thing and Twice all the rest of that. Twice. For me, and I'm going to sound like a giant bigot, but I'm not, I promise. But for me, it's a racial thing. You know, that's, you know, they have a black president. Um, you can't serve with a conservative president voluntarily like he did and suddenly go, well, yeah, you know, socialism is okay. You can't do that. So for me, I think there's social issues associated (laughs) with that endorsement. However, it's adorable. What? Throwing the socialism thing in there. Oh, it's adorable. Yeah. Yeah, Thanks. But, uh, the, but the truth is, um, both, uh, general Petraeus would have my vote. Um, there's a lot of retired military that would have my vote if they would decide to run. Um, and, and, um, I can't recall the general's name off the top of my head. It's not the crystal. It is, um, it's not general Allen anyway, but there's a lot of military mm-hmm. folks I would vote for. Cause I think they're pretty reasonable. So that's really fair strange. enough. So, well, we're not going to have another commercial break. We're going to go straight to the medical minute. Okay. Do you have your Lubina slob brief all geared up? I, uh, I, I think I've got something in mind. Okay. 
Our medical minute now, sleep apnea. Now, a lot of people, you know, they complain of being tired all the time. Sometimes that's your lifestyle. Sometimes that's, you know, drinking a whole lot of caffeine just to get through the day. And then the next day have a, you know, a withdrawal effect from it. Uh, sometimes um, you lay awake at night with a lot of anxieties, worry, and can't sleep and you're tired. Here's some things that can, that can separate you from, from, you know, just regular life events from sleep apnea. First of all, if you're not doing anything, do you find yourself dozing off? You're watching some TV, watch your favorite show. Next thing you know, you're asleep. Um, next, uh, like if you're driving somewhere in a long distance, you have to pull over or you're afraid you're always going to be going to sleep. That could be a slant sign of sleep apnea. Um, if you always feel like you're never rested, let's say you get 10 hours of sleep at night, you wake up just as tired as when you went to bed. That could be it. If you live with somebody, do you snore? Does it, does it, do they describe the fact that, you know, you're not breathing and then suddenly you do one of these. <laughs> all right. That can all be sleep apnea. The reason you need to get this treated and we have a lot of good treatments. now. The reason you need to get this treated is people with sleep apnea have a higher rate of heart disease, heart attack, and diabetes. Um, you have to eliminate a lot of the physical causes of tiredness, but, they now have free screenings for sleep apnea and the test that they use, you can now use, you just stick this helmet like thing on your head. You go home, you sleep, you bring it back the next day. You don't have to schedule with a, uh, with a, uh, uh, sleep doctor. You can do this at home. So you don't have to go in. You don't have to stay there three nights. You don't have to go to the hospital. You don't have to do all this, all this other stuff. That's really a pain. Um, it's up to you. Now, if you want, to find out more information, you can go give my office a call and we'll get you in and get, get a screening for you. And, uh, there are plenty of, of information, plenty of information out there. I recommend the national Institute of health and that's NIH.gov. And you can look up all kinds of good, reliable information on there. Cause we all know the internet's full of crap most of the time, especially when lefties on here just by himself. It's lefty, true. let's go with the lefty legal bent. Minute. Actually, I've changed my mind. I'm going to tell I'm going to tell the folks out there a little bit what what's uh, going on in Des Moines from a music scene standpoint oh, for the next couple terrific. of days. I love that. So um, tomorrow, and and a lot of these, and I'm just pulling this off my own uh, my own Facebook feed. So you, most of these are people that I know and I can personally vouch for. Uh, tomorrow, you got uh, at the uh, Bombay Bicycle Club, which is over by our old office in Clive. Uh, best damn band, uh, battle of the bands competition 2.0. That's always a really great time tomorrow. Also, um, is the open jam session hosted by it's complicated, a really great band. Um, a bunch of good friends of mine in that band and they're fantastic. Uh, so if you play an instrument, sing, otherwise entertain, get down to the open jam at the standard martini bar. That's just down here downtown. Um, that's tomorrow. Uh, later on in the, uh, in the week. Well, actually, and this is the big one Saturday. Little Big Fest is coming back to uh, Des Moines, but it's different. It used to be in the Hotel Fort Des Moines every single year, and now this is the seventh, uh, the seventh annual Little Big Fest. Bunch of independent, unsigned bands, local talent from Des Moines, going to be held at Woolies, the House of Bricks, and the Underground. Now that is a that's a lot. It's a lot of music, and the cover charge is really cheap. It's like fifteen bucks to hear about eight bands. The Chronicles, another good friend of mine. Uh, Jeff Safford fronts that band, and they're fantastic. This power trio that does a lot of really. Really, really good music. Um, I will be performing at the uh, Ducktail Lounge in Clive on Saturday from nine to one. That's this coming Saturday, and that's a that's about all I have time for. I can just tell you that you need to get out and you need to support these local folks. Not just bands, also stand-up comedians. I was I was at the uh, uh, Des Moines, Iowa uh, comic book convention just this uh, past weekend. Did you know that? That Io has a, a combo yeah. convention icon. Yeah, comic. over. Well, there's also a, yeah, yeah, at at, a, at all play here in Des Moines. Yeah, you bet. One of my uh, one of my um, old buddies who I hadn't seen in forever had a book out that I bought and it's great. It's called Floating Bunny Head. You should check that out on the internet. His name is John Sims and he's a fantastic artist. Does his own work. Also publishes comic book himself. So that's uh, right. a little bit of a self made entrepreneurial story there for you, Doc. To end Absolutely. out the hour. Hey, that's great. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. Thank you to my friend Tommy O for calling in. Um, we will be here next week from 6 to 7 p.m. Um, if there's anything interesting that you would want to have us discuss, please let us know. We are on Facebook at Doc and Lefty um, or me, 
Pat Bertrosch or Blake Lubinus. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We will see you all next week.